Now, Wendy McElroy, I mean, traditionally, feminists seem to have two positions on, uh, on pornography, either one outright opposition based on a concern for the degradation of women or uh, opposition to censorship, but never really outright support for pornography. Now, you have taken a personal journey into the seamy underside of the pornography industry and come out with a completely different take on things. Uh, but before we get into that, I'd really be interested to know what kind of preconceived notions you had as you began your research on pornography in the pornographic industry. What you've described as pornography degradating women is really the gender of radical feminist point of view right now, and the idea that there's really something wrong and degrading with it, but we have to put up with it because freedom of speech is too important, mm -hmm. is the liberal feminist view. Right. I'm a throwback. I took some of the misconceptions with me that came from both of those camps when I started to go and actually knock on the door of XX pornographers and see how are women treated, what are they paid, what are the working conditions, do they feel degraded. One of the things that I took with me and I thought perhaps was valid, I didn't know, was the claim from gender feminism that women were coerced into the mm -hmm. industry, that they were forced to perform sex acts. When I went, I found not only did I not meet a woman, and I met several dozen women, I did surveys of, of several dozen others, I met not a single woman who had ever been coerced into a sex act, nor did, did I meet a woman who knew a woman who had been coerced into a sex act. As a matter of fact, the women enjoyed what they did. Yet, yet Catherine McKinnon, the noted feminist legalist, I mean, has said, I, I'll read it here because I just said, yes. all pornography is made under conditions of inequality based on sex by poor, desperate women who are sexually abused as children. Mm -hmm. Your research said that's completely false. How, how, could, how could she and, and we in turn come to that conclusion if it's, if it's groundless? Well, Catherine McKinnon also says that if pornography is part of your sexuality, you have no right to your sexuality. She comes from a point of view that men and women are totally antagonistic classes. We have separate interests that necessarily conflict so that you as a man are, are for example, a rapist. Mm -hmm. Whether or not you individually have ever raped, you're part of the rape class and I'm part of the victim class. When you look at society that way, everything that has to do with sex is prima facie and before any research oppression. But if you go and look at the realities, if you step away from ideology and say, well, let's take that ideology and compare it to what exists out there and see empirically, are these empirical claims that they're making true, women are oppressed, women are exploited, those claims just break down immediately. But it's also interesting when I mean, you talk to a lot of producers also yes. who, uh, uh, who claim that, they're, that what violence you might see in a, in a pornographic movie is almost always simulated. I mean, how do they draw the line between, and where do they draw the line mm -hmm. between kind of what is violence and, and, and what isn't? It's not almost always simulated. It is always simulated. Uh, even in SM and Bondage, uh, about 1993 or 1994, the American porn industry, and I say American porn industry because I believe that the Japanese porn industry and other foreign industries actually have scenes of violence, mm -hmm. in which case it's not pornography. It is films of crime. Uh, but pornography in America is between consenting adults, and they started in 84 being so paranoid of the police coming and throwing them in jail, closing down the industry, which was imminent. It, it was, there was a real crackdown, that they started censoring uh, scenes of rape. It's almost impossible to find rape scenes past about 1984 when women, there was one, one film company I talked to that splices hardcore movies down, taking out scenes to make them to softcore. Right. And when women have orgasms in their films, if they say something like, oh, God, they cut that out because they are afraid of offending their audience. That is how almost paranoid they are being about violence and self-censorship. It's swinging the other way. But, I mean, but, but they, you, in your defense, without that mm -hmm. you need to be defended, <laughs> uh, I mean, do say that, that there is pornography that is acceptable. In fact, you say healthy and beneficial yes. to women, and that there's other stuff that, that, that is unacceptable. Where is that line for you? I mean, there, there are films on bestiality and, mm -hmm. you know, all child pornography. And these, you obviously don't think, are mm -hmm. healthy, beneficial expressions of sexuality for women. No, not at all. I, the line is very clearly to me consenting adults. Are the adults in there capable of consent, and have they said yes? And if they've said yes, then I would make the claim, uh, the extreme claim, that women as a class benefit even from SM, even from bondage, even though perhaps individual women choose, and most individual women would choose, including me, not to participate in that, not to consume that, because it's just not my choice. All choices, 
all range of choices benefit me as an individual because it expands the range of what's out there for me. As long as it's consenting, as long as it's adult, it benefits women. Another thing that I was very interested in in your book is just how much control women have over the industry itself. I'm not just talking mm -hmm. about the actresses, and there's something in New Yorker apparently that this issue, you know, documenting how women are almost dominating the uh, the, the, the the porn industry. Mm -hmm. Is how did this come about? It came about there. There, first of all, the porn industry. I have to be careful. Is not a monolith. So I would say there's areas of the porn industry where women don't dominate, but there's a real trend coming now where women are starting to get a lot of power because they're moving from in front of the camera to behind the camera. Women like uh, Candida Royale, mm -hmm, Tiffany, oh, she's wonderful. She's a producer who's doing erotica for women and men who love women who love erotica. And Tiffany Million, uh, they're doing uh, feminist uh, er uh, porn books like On Your Back are coming out and they're being very aggressive in redefining. And this is a phenomenon that's gone on in pornography like any other industry, whether it's banking or, or any other place. Uh, women are asserting themselves. In pornography, it's probably a little easier because women have always been the feature. Women have always been paid more. They've always been the pull. Uh, what used to be the case is they were the feature just like racehorses at a racetrack were the, were the feature, and you don't negotiate or respect a racehorse necessarily, though you pamper it. Now they're getting the respect, and they're getting the, the power to negotiate their own terms. I uh, caught my son with an adult movie and uh, admonished him to no particular end. And it had nothing to do with degradation of, mm -hmm. of women. I, I wanted to make the point that this was not how women behaved. Normally, women don't just walk into a room with four men and have sex with them. And I didn't want him to think that sexual intimacy was something that was displayed on, on, on pornography. I mean, what about that as a, as a concern? It's, it's not a woman's concern, but a relationship concern between men and women, and that pornography does suggest relationships that don't seem to have any deep abiding intimacy or, or loving relationships underscoring them. You see, I, in some sense, I don't give the same sort of uh, weight to pornography as people who, who, who think that it's that kind of apparel. I think that if you watch a Terminator movie or you watch a, a, an Agatha Christie movie, you don't really think people are murderers and you don't really think people have Uzis and go and shoot up banks. I think people look at a fantasy, which is pretty obviously what it is. If you look at the women acting in most porn movies, and you know no one you have ever met has acted that way, it's a fantasy. It's a harmless fantasy. Uh, so I, I think the whole, I, first of all, parents like you, uh, who sit down and give their children perspective on pornography are doing exact. I wish every every parent would do that because the harm that's done to children by pornography is mostly that they look at this and they can't discuss it. They don't have people they can go to who will give them perspective and mm -hmm. say, where does this fit into the into the wide range of reality and choices out right. there? What about the the argument that that there's watching pornography, there's a certain anesthetization, desensitization that goes on over time that you might like stuff that's mildly erotic first, but that you have a, you know, almost an insatiable appetite to progress along a continuum of raunchier and raunchier things. I don't know. That hasn't been true of me. Has it been true of you? <laughs> <laughs> Samples of one we shouldn't talk about. But, uh... Well, on the other hand, I'm the only basis I have to make mm -hmm. any judgment on. Um, I know that's an argument. I think there's been a lot of research to say that the effect of pornography is really very short-lived. Uh, that, in fact, when you st they've done research on uh, college students, which is in itself a, never a random sample, mm -hmm. which says that basically after view viewing pornography, they have these images, they basically uh, have certain arousal patterns or whatever, and 20 minutes later, an hour later, they basically revert to exactly how they feel uh, when they walk in the room. But they, uh, again, I think about walking into a room that if, you know, Tracy Lords or whoever came into a room of men, mm -hmm. they certainly wouldn't want to sit around and have a conversation about Bosnia with her. I mean, there would be an objectification. Forget about the women. It creates uh, a mental picture of women for men that's probably not very healthy for men to hold, to view a lot of these, these people as, well, suffice to say, nothing other than sex objects. Well... First of all, I don't think there's anything wrong with dealing and focusing on a woman's sexuality, whether it's from the woman presenting herself sexually mm -hmm. or the man looking at her sexually. Right now, here, I'm presenting myself to you as an intellectual object, and you are dealing with me intellectual and ignoring my sexuality entirely. 
Now, why is it I like to exhibit my sexuality? Mm -hmm. I'm a writer. I like to flash it, and I will flash it as big an audience as I can. I wish you, you know, you were CNN. <laughs> um, but I'm, uh, I don't see anything wrong with a woman who has a comparable feeling about her sexuality coming and saying, not only do I want to flash my sexuality, but I want to do it in front of an applauding audience. I think we're demonizing sex to say that somehow being a sexual object is invalid and being an intellectual object is wonderful. Do, do you think that the women who are making pornography are making a different kind of pornography? Some of them are. Uh, I, I've, I've talked to a, a wide range. I know there's, people say there's a difference between male and female pornography. And in general, when I talk to women like Candida Royale, she makes pornography that tends to be softer, it focuses on uh, women. Uh, one of my favorite movies is Three Daughters that focuses on a, woman's, a, a young woman's awakening. And very realistic in, I think, how women awaken sexually, which is different than how men awaken sexually. So that, that's very nice to see. There's scripts, there's, there's uh, soundtracks, there's things that, that make it more into the category of art. But at the same time, Kat Sunlove, who calls herself a little missionary for SM, she was uh, kind of the dear Abby of SM. She had a little column she wrote in a, in a magazine. Uh, she simply will not be divorced from her, her whips and her chains. She basically loves that hardcore sex, and I respect either choice. Now, there's a more traditional argument against um, pornography that, that women don't necessarily marshal, but that, that others do, and that is that you know, the cornerstone of civil society is, is that we accept, as a majority culture, mm -hmm. certain standards of yes. acceptable, and it includes decency, and that we give up our right to individual expression. The, our speed limits perhaps are arbitrary. I could drive 140 kilometers an hour safely, but I decide for the good of society, I won't. Does, how does pornography fall in into that? For the good of society, I don't think sadomasochism is healthy. And so I say none of it. What would your reaction to me be with that argument? I think that, well, first of all, for the good of society, I think we have to discuss sex. I have to, we, we have to be out in the open. I think we live in a society that is sexually very unhealthy. And the kind of rape and, and fear that women have to feel when they walk down the street, me included, I, you know, uh, is intolerable. A way to open up discussion is to actually look at sex as the kind of primal and dangerous thing it can be. I mean, sex urges don't come to dressed up in top hats and have dinner manners. They are very primal things, and they have a lot of power. And if you take them and you press against them, it's like pressing on a spring. Mm -hmm. The more you push against it, the more dangerous and forceful it becomes. I want SM to be out there and in the open and people to look at it, not because it's dangerous, but because that diffuses the danger. Oh, so, so you think that by virtue of seeing sadomasochism, given that my judgment is relatively sound, that I would look at this and say, not for me. I have no, no need to experiment. You know, I tell you, I, I did a lot of looking at SM because I thought that if women are going to be, all the, all the claims about women being mistreated and beaten and exploited, I thought it was going to be true anywhere. It's going to be true mm -hmm. in, S in, in SM, sure. their SM rather than in penthouse models. Right. And so I, that's, where, that's why XXX, a woman's right to pornography, is called XXX. Um, and I looked at these people dressed up in their rubber costumes and their whips, and they didn't look dangerous. They looked silly. Uh, and that diffused SM for me, and I sat down and tried to have conversations with people who had spiked collars, and I had to sometimes go like this because uh, you have... And that you, says a lot about what you see of the human condition. I mean, you have a lot of faith in people's judgment. That's also part of you know, your going-in proposition, I would think. Well, I'm, I'm a people, and <laughs> I, as I said, on the, on the basis of I never think knowledge and exposure mm -hmm. hurts people as long as it's done with perspective. If you demonize something and then expose people to it, I think that can be very, very harmful. Right. Give them the realities. You also, on the kind of your individualist feminist position, you're talking about, you know, a woman's body, a, a woman's choice. You say that, that pornography breaks the link between sex and marriage and, and, and sex and children. Uh, again, it maybe sounds kind of stupid, but what's so liberating about that? I mean, I've always thought kind of sex and marriage and sex and children are good things. Well, coming from a monogamous and very happy marriage, I would agree with you. But what I, what I really meant, if I, or perhaps misstated, was that it breaks any necessary link. What pornography says is you don't have to be married to have sex. Mm -hmm. You don't have to, to do it to have children. That sex isn't of itself, in all its varieties, a valid thing to pursue. Um, the, the converse, though, is very interesting, is that 
to improve my sexuality, do I need pornography? Or I wouldn't. I, I think I think sexuality is such a banquet of choices, and I've never met a someone feast, a, a, feast. a feast. I mean, I'm down at one end having an egg salad sandwich, but a lot of people are on the other end having caviar. You know? I like my egg salad sandwich. Um, my and in terms of marriage. My husband and I have improved our marriage with pornography because, as I said, I'm in a very good marriage, and the last thing in the world I ever want to do is hurt someone I love. But I have the same sort of healthy curiosity in general that led me to do this book. And one of the ways I found that it satisfies it is sitting on a Saturday night with my husband, watching a porn flick, throwing popcorn at the screen, drinking a glass, making rude comments to the actors, because let's face it, the quality isn't that good. It, it's uh, been something that has been very beneficial to my marriage, so at least in some marriages, it can be helpful. Now, don't take anything in the segue, but I also understand the big <laughs> trend is, is towards home videos, and not home videos for personal use, for, for resale, that people are making yes. their own pornographic videos in the comfort of their own home, selling them, splicing them together, and this is a big, big growth market. That's the biggest growth market right now, and I don't take it badly. I'm a consumer. I'm not a producer. <laughs> Uh, there is a danger in the in the porn uh, home porn, and that is people always ask about children's pornography right. or or battery or, or real violence. The porn industry itself, proper, the actual industry of pornography, where you have producers and studios and agents and and distributors, are so paranoid about children pornography and about uh, uh, real violence that they are actually turning each other into the police. I saw someone get an award for having done that at, at a, a pornographer's banquet. However, the porn, home porn industry, as it's called, is probably to the extent that that goes on, it goes on there, because to police that, what you need to do is go into people's homes and say, let me see what's on your camcorder. Mm -hmm. And there are such uh, you know, violations of privacy rights that that's almost impossible to do, and it's a real problem. Now, the 1992 uh, court decision, the so-called Butler decision that mm -hmm. moved uh, pornography away from community standards to a harm-based test, whether this degraded women or, or hurt women, whatever was on, on the screen or, 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 or in the books, was the case was marshaled, I guess, largely by, by LEAF, the uh, legal fund for the feminist mm -hmm. movement yes. in, in, uh, in Canada. What have you seen as a consequence of that decision in, uh, in, in Canada? It has been disastrous for feminism in Canada. Two of the major feminist bookstores in Canada are the Little Sisters Bookstore in Vancouver right. and the Glad Day Bookstore in Toronto. Uh, both of them are lesbian feminist bookstores and they have been targeted. They were the first targets of the Butler decision. Now the Butler decision gave huge arbitrary power to custom officials to decide for themselves pretty much which XX pornography they would let in and which they wouldn't. There were some standards, but also there was a great deal of judgment call involved. The Glad Day Bookstore and the Little Sisters Bookstore have been persecuted to the point of they cannot import, they, they almost can't get shipments from the United States. The Little Sisters Bookstore is launching the major challenge to the Butler decision, and the Glad Day Bookstore is getting to the point where it cannot import science fiction books because anything is held up at the border. Um, I have not seen feminist groups stand up and say, this is wrong. Two of the major feminist lesbian bookstores in, Amer in Canada are being persecuted by laws promoted by feminists, and feminists are not saying a word. Some of the liberal feminists, though, I gather, are saying that maybe this wasn't such a good decision because what it's done is, is just shifted the focus onto lesbian and gay uh, literature. It's starting to happen, yes. Uh, Feminists for Free Expression, Thelma McCormick, who now mm -hmm. heads that, is, is making that kind of a statement. And lesbian feminists, who are now in, the, in, in both North America, Canada and the United States, all across North America, are now the ones starting to question, saying, goodness, maybe sexual liberation, which freed us, when it's taken away, will be part of our oppression. And ironically, of course, it's feminists who are now pushing to take away that sexual liberation. Now, above and beyond providing research and an intellectual foundation for your argument that pornography is healthy and beneficial to uh, women, I was also very interested in your observations about the feminist movement and mm -hmm. the, the fact that they found themselves with a very strange ally in their anti-pornography stance yes. uh, vis a vis the ultra-right ultra, ultra right and, and conservatives. How did feminists allow themselves, to pardon the pun, get into bed 
with, with the right on, on this issue. Well, a lot of us have asked gender feminists that, and their response is that pornography is such a, a core to women's oppression. They see it as the key. Pornography is rape. You're quite right. They see no difference between the image and the act. They say it as so key that they're willing to use patriarchal court systems, they're willing to use patriarchal police uh, systems, and actually join hands with the moral majority, who are their largest supporters in yes, this. Yes, and, and who clearly have virtually no other interest that they share Who would crush them, who would crush them in a moment on any other issue. And it is a huge mistake, because the next campaign that is heating up in feminism right now is abortion. Abortion is really being taken to the wall. And feminists are going to have to stand on the same stage with people that they have bitterly attacked and in very ad hominem terms. And I don't know if the abortion crusade can co cohere the way it did in the 60s when it needs to in the 90s because they're not only aligning with people and strengthening their enemies, they are alienating their best friends. Is this part of your argument, finding resonance with, with feminists who otherwise have been anti-pornography? Anti, anti because yeah. I, I quite frankly hadn't seen it marshaled before and thought it was quite illuminating. It is. It is very much, especially uh, when you're down in the, in the States, where, where men, much of my research has taken place, because even though I'm Canadian, I was born in Ottawa, I've lived most of my life in the States, and much of my research was based there, if for no other reason than most pornography in North America is made in, in America. Mm -hmm. uh, when you go to, to talk to women who have been fighting, uh, lesbians perhaps, who have been fighting against these anti-pornography ordinances, and who stood in crowds, and they've been the only feminists there, except for the other ones standing up and saying that pornography was, was evil. And the rest of the crowd were people who were Christians, were basically wearing T-shirts that were, were, were anti-sex, anti-feminist, and were standing holding hands with the feminists there. The feeling is so deep of betrayal that the schism is going to basically create, I think, two different types of feminism. It already has. Now, at the root of your individual feminism is the noise that choice is, in, is inherently good and that you, yes. you argue and, and defend a lot of your position on freedom of expression and freedom of, uh, of speech. Now, while a Canadian, your research is, is, is in America, you're obviously very cognizant of the fact that Canada simply does not have the tradition of free speech or freedom of expression. We're more than prepared to, you know, ban press coverage of the Bernardo mm -hmm. trials rather than have OJ. Are you having a harder time marshalling your case in Canada than, uh, than, than in America? Yes, I am. Uh, Canada has a tradition of being willing to sacrifice individual rights for the sure. good of society. And I have my perspective is, of course, that, that society is nothing but benefited by peaceful individuals being as diverse as they possibly can, and that imposing your will, that law is not meant to impose a code of morality, but to protect people and, and property from violence. The First Amendment is a very big protection in the States, and you, you resonate with people when you bring that argument out. Sure, that's how they defend guns, for example. But up here, there is much more of a sense of a paternalistic state, mm -hmm. that the, the state basically is there to protect me against my will, if necessary, because the state knows better than a poor, incompetent woman like me what I want sexually. And that may seem sarcastic, but that's what it comes down to. That's what things like the Butler decision comes down to. The net effect up here, one of the net effects, is you cannot import films from Candida Royale because she says her films, it's a flip of the coin. Is my film going to be seized by the customs officials or is it not? I won't do business up here. So women's pornography produced for women is finding a hard time getting across the border. Is that, is that produced an industry, an indigenous industry in Canada that didn't exist before? <laughs> that it, that's one of the effects of it. One of the things that uh, has been jokingly said by American pornographers to me is that the Butler decision is a make-work legislation for Canadian pornographers because there's certain forms of pornography, which obviously has a market up here because it mm -hmm. was bought and purchased, which can't be produced and, can, and is illegal and risky to take across the border. And so if, in fact, the Canadian government wants to subsidize Canadian pornographies, they should pass more laws saying that uh, American pornographers are not welcome here and we can have our own industry. I don't think that's its intent. Now, lest anyone think that you are an unbridled, <laughs> unequivocal defender of the porn industry, I mean, it's clear that your book goes through the kind of changes that you yes. would like to see happen in, uh, in, in that industry, both in terms of the portrayal of women and, and the conditions of work. I mean, what, yes. kind of, what kind of changes would you like to see there? There's two types of changes, I think, that are absolutely necessary for the porn industry. One is changes within the industry itself where men 
Uh, it's still largely uh, an old boy network with a new force coming up and that is, is be beginning to have quite an impact. But in the old boy network, you don't have things like contracts. You don't have things like women signing releases, getting royalties. You don't have courts of arbitration like you do in ordinary actresses, can, mm -hmm. go, can go to the Writers Guild or right. whatever. You need that kind of organizational structure. On the outside, you need to have society stop stigmatizing the industry to the degree that, that courts will not respect contracts. Whatever contracts exist, I've, ha I've seen women had them thrown out of court because, because they're frivolous. Because I, I am a member of the porn industry, therefore my contract can't. It is frivolous. Uh, and it, it's not even considered by, by the courts to be valid. The police still harass porn actresses. Uh, Nina Hartley, uh, one of the biggest porn actresses in North America, is still under charges for felony lesbianism, and she is targeted because she's in the porn industry. Porn in actresses have their children taken away. So within the industry, they have to have the same sort of legitimate structures that any other acting industry has, like Hollywood ha would have outside the industry, their contracts have to be respected and they have to be, the laws that protect every other woman in North America have to be extended respectfully to them.